Um, our next presenter is Aristark Surinark. Um, he uh, is a Master of Science from uh, Uppsala University in pharmacological sciences with drug discovery and de development as the main field of study. And he's currently a PhD student at uh, Nostrum Biodiversity Spain, where he's also trained as a pro project manager um, in the drug discovery division. Um, he's going to talk about uh, could uh, free energy calculations with Gromax be faster? Uh, Nostrum Biodiversity is attempt to achieve this goal. So my name is Elista Srinyak, and as you said, I'm a PhD student at Nostrum Biodiscovery, and I will be presenting this presentation uh, with the title Could Free Energy Calculations with Gromax, Gromax be faster? And I will explain our attempt to achieve this goal. So first, I would like to start to introduce a bit Nostrum Biodiscovery. Uh, we are a company uh, situated in Barcelona at the Scientific Park, uh, which is that one in the photo. Uh, the company was founded in 2015, and the two co-founders are Victor Bollar and Modesco Rodko. They are both group leaders um, with more than 20 years of experience. Uh, working with drug design, uh, molecular modeling, and enzyme engineering. And the value of the company is based on these three points, uh, our team, the software, and the hardware. Our, um, we are a team of modelers uh, with IT and uh, AI experts. We work with some proprietary softwares uh, like PyDoc and Pele. And we can also use third party tools like Schrodinger and Gromax and some others. And finally, we also have our hardware. Uh, we have our cluster uh, that we can use in order to tackle the different projects our clients need. Okay, so now I'm going to start with the presentation. Uh, the main answer we asked ourselves was if we could. Uh, calculate free energy with Chromax faster. And this is the, how we uh, tackle this, this issue. Uh, here is the other of the presentation. I will start with a bit of an introduction, and then I will focus on the case study, talking about the protein uh, binding. So to start, uh, I want to talk a bit about the drug discovery and development process. Here you can see the different stages. Uh, and some of the computational techniques that are applied to the different stages. As you know, the drug discovery and development process can take up to 10 years and it costs hundreds of millions of dollars. And as you go on in every stage, the money you have to spend for the experiments and tests increases. So it is very important that when you go to the following step, you are confident about your previous results. Uh, otherwise, you may end up losing a lot of money uh, and even still with, with these and uh, all the money you can lose, but the failing rate of the drugs, that drugs that doesn't reach the, the market approval is higher than 70%. So uh, with that, one could think that it is very important and it's crucial to spend more time on early stages. So you prevent, the, you prevent to fail on the later stages. And a way of doing that is implementing computational based techniques like these ones you can see here, uh, which are adding a lot of information and reducing the number of experiments. They also help to predict possible outcomes in later stages. So at the end, applying computational techniques save a lot of uh, time and a lot of money. And in the case I will explain today, uh, I will focus on the lead optimization stage and a molecular dynamic simulation. So at this stage, uh, the main objective, or one of the main objectives, is to optimize the lead to get a molecule with the highest affinity with your target of interest. And molecular dynamics can help on that. Uh, the binding free energy calculations uh, can help us to know uh, which is the ligand that has more affinity to our target of interest. The free energy, uh, as you probably know, is the sum of enthalpy and the product of the temperature and the entropy of the system. 
when this delta G is negative, it means that this process is a spontaneous, uh, so that the binding is favorite. And the lower the free energy, the, the higher affinity of the ligand to the protein. But calculating this uh, absolute free energy for one ligand, this delta G here, from uh, where the ligand goes from unbound to bound state, it is still very difficult because it would require uh, long uh, simulations, molecular dynamic simulations. But a way of um, tackle this is uh, calculating the relative binding free energy. So as I just said, the absolute binding free energy, which would be this delta GA for ligand A, is very difficult because it requires long simulations. But if we have two ligands, ligand A and ligand B, it is possible to calculate the difference of the uh, binding energy between them. As, so as it was difficult just with one, now we have two. But here, the key thing is that uh, now we can close the thermodynamic uh, cycle and we can calculate the relative binding free energy. This delta delta G doing delta uh, G2 minus delta G1. And this would answer the question of which ligand has a higher affinity. A negative delta delta G would mean that the, the ligand B uh, has a higher affinity than ligand A. And a positive one would mean that ligand A has a higher affinity. And as that said, before, as we are focusing on the little optimization stage, uh, and we want to find the ligand with a higher affinity, we will probably here at this stage, we will probably have a, a set of hundreds of, or even thousands of quite similar ligands, and we want to choose the best ones, the, the ones that has uh, uh, more affinity to our target. So if we wisely connect all these ligands, uh, that they have a similar scaffold, then we could calculate the relative binding uh, affinity of the whole ligand sets. And if we know one delta G uh, experimental for one of the ligands of the set, then we can estimate the delta G of the other ligands. So now the question is how we calculate delta G2 and delta G1. Sorry. Here. So to calculate delta G2 and delta G1, uh, we are using a method called thermodynamic integration. Uh, and the first thing we have to do here is to do the four molecular dynamic simulation you see here in the thermodynamic cycle. Uh, we have to uh, simulate ligand A in water, ligand B in water, the ligand A bound to the protein, and ligand B bound to the protein. Then once we have that, uh, we have to extract some snapshots. If we look at this image here, for example, with the two system, ligand A uh, with a protein and ligand B with a protein. Here we have to extract uh, some snapshots and then we run fast molecular dynamic simulations uh, changing from ligand A to ligand B. And, uh, and with that, then we can calculate the working diagram with all this, all these assumptions and this fast simulation changing from A to B. We can calculate the working diagram. You can see here, and then uh, we can do the same with uh, protein B, uh, ligand B in with the protein, and uh, take the snapshot and run the fast molecular dynamic simulations changing from uh, ligand B to ligand A. And then we will have this other uh, working diagram, which is the forward and the reverse. And then as we are working with similar compounds, we expect that these two diagrams will have an overlap and the intersection of the overlap is gonna be the delta G. In that case, it would be the delta G protein. So this delta G two. And then we would do the same with the system, with the water systems. And we will get the delta G uh, one, which is delta G water. And then to calculate the relative binding affinity, we can do delta G protein minus delta G water. So to sum up a bit, the objective of this project was to create a, a protocol to calculate free energy in a fast way. 
And the idea is to use this workflow in the lead optimization stage and to guide AI big and generative model. So the, our strategy to tackle this issue, uh, you can was this one. First we did a uh, literature search, then uh, we did a benchmark study, then we designed it and validated the workflow. And finally, uh, we did some, uh, we applied to industry. Uh, checking the literature, we found that we found this paper, and he, uh, here they calculate the relative protein ligand binding affinity for 13 different systems using PMX and Gromax. And if we look at the results of all of the systems, we can see that uh, they have a good correlation and a good uh, error estimation. So, and it, it's similar to some other commercial software. So, uh, it seems that it's a good method. And the workflow that they use is this one here. They are working with uh, two different force fields, general number force field and charm general force field to parameterize the, light, the ligand. Then they select the edges. Uh, if you are not familiar with that, uh, when I said selecting the edges, I mean pairing the ligands and connecting all the ligands of the set. Then they build a hybrid topology for each pair of ligands. Then they run the molecular dynamic simulations with these steps. First, they do an energy minimization, then a 10 picoseconds MVD ensemble, uh, six nanoseconds for the equilibration uh, simulation. And then they take 80 snapshots and they run uh, uh, 50 picoseconds on equilibrium simulations. And they do uh, to replicate for each of the force field. And finally, they analyze the results. So the total time they need uh, for a pair of ligands is 40 nanoseconds. And as they are doing three replicates for each force field, so a total of six replicates, they, are, they, they need a simulation. The total simulation time is 240 nanoseconds. And here you can see uh, the results of one of the, the systems of this paper. Here is for Jang1, uh, which has 20 and 21 ligands. Here you see the, the average with the general number force field, the average for the charm general force field, and the average of the six um, of the six replicates. <clears throat> and as you can see, this one is the best. It has the best correlations and also the best uh, error estimation. Uh, these are in kilojoules model. So the, <clears throat> so the next step for us was trying to uh, replicate the results, but trying to do it with a faster workflow. So now I will start talking about uh, our approach. Uh, if we look at the workflow, we have different stages and in each stage, we have different things we can modify in order to optimize the workflow and calculate the binding free energy. And now I will follow this workflow and I will show some of the results uh, we obtain in changing these parameters. So for the setup, uh, we decided to work with just one force field instead of the two and a study if we could get similar results with shorter simulations and we should general numbers force field. Then uh, for the protein preparation, it is important to have a reliable structure and build a protein model as accurate as possible. It is also important to consider uh, which ligand to use for the protein equilibration. Uh, you can use a centered ligand, so it's the most similar to all the other ligands, or you can use uh, the largest ligand of the set uh, in order to prevent having um, issues, space issues in the binding site when you place the other ligands of the set. <clears throat> then to select the edges, we try two strategies. The first one, uh, we only work with the similarity score. Um, well, that's it. this is to pair the ligands, as I said before. So the first one, uh, we work with the similarity score, pairing the, the ligands based only on the number of pair atoms between the between the ligands of the set. And then we build the minimum spanning tree based on the similarity score. Uh, as the results were very good, we also tried to build a second minimum spanning tree to have more transitions and more pairs. 
and studying more this system. Uh, and then we also tried Clomap, which is an algorithm done by uh, Mobley Lab, that a part of considering the similarity between uh, ligands, it also considers uh, the rings of each systems, the net charge, and it has some other rules. And it also connects the ligands using different strategies, uh, like radial or a half, or you can do it like a tree. And they also uh, close the molecules in thermodynamic cycles. And connecting the molecules in, in cycles, it has an advantage, and I will show you later. Uh, and if we look into the result, well, here is the an example of the of the mapping uh, the ligands with low map. Uh, here you can see that we are using the the radial strategy, uh, which means that all the ligands are connected to a centered ligand, ligand, and also that uh, all the ligands are connected at least at least with two other ligands. Now, yeah, now we have the results. Uh, with the two strategies uh, for the system we started from the benchmark. Uh, if we look into the results, we can see that if, when working with the similarity score, uh, the results are, are don't converge and we have different trends with the different replicates. But when working with Loma, we have uh, a good trend and the results converge. So, uh, the way you pair the ligands is crucial to get uh, good results at the end. Then the following step is the hybrid topology. So the two common ways to build the hybrid topologies for chemical calculations are single and dual topology. Uh, here we have an example to convert the benzene to benzyl alcohol. Uh, here on the left, we have the single topology that converts uh, from one atom type to another, and the, the dummy atoms are used uh, where there is no match between the two structures. And on the right side, we have the dual topology, uh, which is uh, not converts one species to another, but it only converts uh, between dummy atoms and interactive species. Uh, but uh, here, uh, what we used to build the uh, hybrid topologies, uh, it was PMX, which were very good, and I know that you had a lecture with uh, Betas, and I'm sure he explained that with more details and much better. So following the workflow, then if we go to uh, MD simulations, uh, here is the steps uh, we use for the MD simulations. First, we an energy minimization, then we do an, a 10 picosecond MBT ensemble, then we do the equilibrium molecular dynamics uh, simulations, and we try different then uh, for the simulations, one nanosecond, two nanoseconds, three and six nanoseconds. Then we select the snapshots. And finally, uh, we have the non equilibrium uh, MD simulations of 15 picoseconds. And we also tried a uh, different number of non equilibrium 16, 30, 40, and 80. Uh, and the, the snapshots were extracted uh, equidistantly. For, for from each of the trajectory. And the first part of the, uh, the equilibrium where you extract the snapshot is uh, deleted. So uh, to be sure that you are not uh, getting the snapshot that be before the, uh, the, the system is equilibrated because then uh, you introduce error to the calculation. Yeah. If we look into the results, here we have some examples, uh, changing the, the equilibrium simulation length and the number of non-equilibrium runs. Uh, if we look at this one here, six nanoseconds and 80 transitions, we can see that we have a good overlap between the reverse and the, the forward and the backward. Uh, and we can see that we also have a good uncertainty of 0. 72 kilojoules more, which is the best one out of the four. If we look at uh, these two results with three nanoseconds and two nanoseconds, we see that we still have some overlap and is, we have a similar uncertainty of around uh, 125 kilojoules per mole, which is good enough. And if we look to the one nanosecond and 16 non equilibrium runs, uh, we see that, uh, well, here we don't have our 
we don't have an overlap and the uncertainty is very high. So here we decided to, to keep working with the two nanosecond and 30 non equilibrium transitions between, because it's the shortest one and it has uh, good results or good enough. So then what we have to do is to analyze the results. Uh, to analyze the results, we, we use uh, Bayer and Crookes. And we selected the transitions uh, and the path uh, with some scores we have created. Uh, uh, here is um, why before I, I, I said that it was important or in the, when I was talking for, uh, about the edge selection, I said that it was important to connect the ligands in cycles. Uh, and that's because when you want to calculate the delta G or delta G, delta delta G for one ligand, if you have those connected in cycles, then you can connect the, the ligands in the way that you have less error and you have better results. For example, here, if we want to calculate a delta G for ligand five, we have this different path. So based on these scores, we will choose the best one. Uh, and then we, we also created two different strategies to deal with the uh, different replicates. The first one is what I call replicates average. The, so what we do is calculating the average of the three, the three replicates, and then we use this score to, uh, to select the best path to connect the, the ligands. And the other strategy is the individual best. Here, what we do is using this score, we select the best replicate out of the three of them. And then we use again the score to connect the ligands uh, between them and select the best, the best path. And now uh, we can look at the result with the Gen 1 system. Here is the here is with the uh, replicate average, and that one is the individual best. Uh, well, and as you can see, the, the individual best is much, much better than the replicates average. And this can be explained because when you have to do the average, uh, we may be introducing a lot of error. Uh, for example, if we have one transition that is very good, but we do the average with other two that that has a poor performance, we end up with the worst results. But uh, on the other hand, if we are we we have a score to select the best transitions out of the three replicates that has the best performance, then uh, this, as you can see here, it improves the, the results quite a lot. And also you can see that the results are quite similar to the ones from the from the literature. Um, so to start summing up, uh, the final workflow is like that. Uh, we do the legal parameterization with the general number force field. Then we select the, the edges with Loma. We created the hybrid topologies using PMX. We run the simulations with Romax, and then we analyze the results. Um, and here uh, we achieve, well, this is the from the paper and that's our workflow. So we achieved to reduce the simulation time from 200, uh, to four, 240 nanoseconds to, to 40 nanoseconds for each second pair. And we are able to calculate the binding free energy with Chromax and PMX much faster than, than this original workflow we started with. <clears throat> if we look into the results, here we have obtained the one I have been talking about. Then here we have another system for the, the, the same benchmark. And here we have an industrial set. And as you can see, we have with all of them uh, good correlations and good uh, error estimation. So it seems that the workflow uh, with this, this shorter workflow, uh, we can obtain good correlations and good results. And finally, I would like to thank the organizers and Thank you also to all of you for your attention. And if you have any question, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.
Sorry, uh, I couldn't unmute my mic. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, just let me check if there are any answer, uh, questions. No questions from the audience. Yeah, no questions, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, thank you again for your sorry for your interesting presenta presentation. I think that with this we conclude this uh, the second uh, morning session on success stories and showcasing of using HPC for biomolecular and applied research in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, now we have a lunch break and we will meet again um, at, in the next uh, session at uh, uh, two o'clock Central European summertime. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.